All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our press briefing. As always, I want to thank all the Nebraskans who have sacrificed so much to slow the spread of coronavirus here in the state of Nebraska. We have been absolutely successful in protecting our hospital capacity. In fact, this morning, we are at 39% of our hospital beds are available, 41% of our ICU beds are available, and 81% of our ventilators are available. So we've been able to provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed, that ventilator to anybody when they've needed it, at the moment they've needed it. That's so uh, it's been uh, really successful with regard to that. So thank you to all the Nebraskans who have sacrificed to be able to make sure they've limited their mobility, they've stayed home and all that to be able to provide uh, that we can make sure we provide for the hospital capacity. In fact, uh, as of yesterday, I think we had about 96 people in the hospitals. That's out of about 4,000 hospital beds. And that's probably about the lowest number we've had since the middle of April. Uh, on April 25th, we had 149 people in the hospitals. On May 27th, we had 232. And we've been on really kind of a, dec uh, a decline ever since then with regards to the number of people in the hospitals. So that's very, very good news with regard to how we've been able to protect the hospital capacity. Now, of course, one of the things we've been doing is loosening up the restrictions. Uh, we went, moved into phase three on June 22nd for most of the state. Uh, four counties that were not a part of that moved into phase three on July 6th. And that had involved in losing some of those restrictions. And then um, uh, we want to remind people that to continue to be able to loosen restrictions, we need to continue to have people practice good social distancing. So remember just kind of three basic things that are just kind of the basic stuff that will help us out a lot, which is one, when you go out in public, try and keep that six foot distance between you and other people. Two, if you're gonna to go to the store, wear a mask, that's always gonna be a good rule. And really kind of the rule around wearing masks is when you're gonna be in, inside in a closed space and closer than six foot to somebody, that's a great opportunity to wear a mask because that will help slow the spread of the virus. We know this, that if both parties are wearing a mask and they're closer than six feet, their chance of spreading the virus approaches zero. So again, if you're gonna be in one of those enclosed spaces where you're gonna to need to wear a mask, that's a great opportunity. And then finally, wash your hands often for 20 seconds at a time. That's another great way to make sure we prevent the slowest virus. So again, keep that six foot of distance from yourself and other people, wear a mask when you go to the store, wash your hands, and that's uh, great social distancing practices that will help us continue to make sure we slow the spread of the virus here in Nebraska. Uh, also want to remind people about testnebraska.com. Uh, we've got now nearly 230,000 people signed up for testnebraska.com. We've done nearly 85, or over 85,000 tests. We are going in a transition from the National Guard to different other providers. And so we are, have a number of different uh, locations across the state that will have regular times for people to come in and test. Uh, we have doubled the number of tests or doubled the days that we're doing testing in Lincoln this week, and we're gonna to continue to look for expanding that. Uh, we took the number of tests uh, in Omaha up. We're expanding them from about 800 slots a day to 1,200 slots a day. And we're also looking for a second location, uh, working on that second location in Omaha as well. So stay tuned for that, but we're gonna to continue to look for ways to be able to expand the access to the, expand the access to that testing testnebraska.com is a great way for everybody to sign up and help the, day, the state combat coronavirus here in Nebraska. So please consider signing up for testnebraska.com. Now, one of the other big things that is gonna be coming up in about a month or so is back to school. And so over the course of the next uh, month or so, we're gonna have a number of press briefings with regard to what educational leaders have planned for back to school whether that's K through 12 or higher education, it's important that we get kids back in classrooms. Uh, we know that, for example, that distance learning for some students is not gonna be as effective. And so those students are gonna do better in a classroom environment. So it's important from an academic standpoint that we get kids back in classrooms. But it's also important from a mental health aspect, right? Social isolation is not good for kids. We wanna get kids back around their colleagues and do it in a safe way, but have them be able to get that uh, social interaction is gonna be important for kids. Also, it's part of, uh, you know, schools contribute to a, a healthy, physical, active, physically active lifestyle. So getting kids back into school will help with that aspect too. 
And then, of course, uh, nutrition, making sure kids are getting the nutrition they need, and especially for those kids who are in um, you know, nutritional and unstable environments. Schools play an important role in providing that nutrition. So there's a lot of reasons why we want to make sure that kids are going back into the classrooms this fall. Now, we know that parents are going to have a lot of concerns, and they are going to have a lot of opinions about how schools are reopening. What I'd ask is for parents to be patient, be gracious, work with your school boards, with your teachers, with your principals, with your superintendents. This is a pandemic that we have not experienced in our country in over a century. We're all learning our way through this. And as we look at bringing kids back into the classroom, it really is going to be almost a building by building decision. And some of these decisions are going to be very difficult. And so please work with your, your schools on this. Uh, again, the same sort of rules are going to apply about social distancing and so forth as we bring kids back. Some schools will be able to do that more easily than others. So we ask for parents really to kind of work together. Remember, this is going to be a difficult time for everybody, but we all have the goal of making sure that the kids are going back into the classrooms this fall. So that's a, that's a very important point. And of course, we also want to make sure we're working with our teachers as well, understanding that uh, just like everybody else, we're going to have to make accommodations in the workforce for teachers just like we do for other uh, occupations. And we want to work with teachers as well to be able to make that happen. To talk more about the plans for K through 12, we've got Matt Bloomstead, the Commissioner of Education, here to talk a little bit about his planning as he's been working with a variety of different groups to be able to make sure that we bring those kids, get those kids back into the classrooms for learning this fall. So, Commissioner, could you come up and talk to us a little about uh, the progress the Department of Education's made? Absolutely. So, thank you, Governor. And uh, as always, one of the things I would tell you that uh, I reflect a little bit on where we've been since March, April, May, and we've talked before about the importance of, of getting kids back in classrooms. I, I've said many times that uh, schools weren't built to be empty. They were built for, for students, really the stars of the education system. And so our, our opportunity really is looking at how we do that and how we do that safely. Uh, the, I appreciate the governor's comments. That the reality is that it's going to take all of us to be able to do this well, uh, to accommodate one another in, in this particular work, to ensure that, that uh, we are making decisions that that are best for each building um, and best for each district and community based on the conditions that they have. Uh, so yesterday, uh, the Department of Education actually in a, kind of a soft release of some guidance to our superintendents statewide released about a 25-page document uh, on planning for a safe return to school. Um, that document's really been built with a lot of uh, a lot of partnerships in mind. In fact, we've we've built partnerships and actually been working with a lot of different groups. For instance, um, uh, NSEA, so the State Education Association, had released guidance for a safe for safe school opening. Again, that became kind of the, one of the other fundamental things that we looked at as we built guidance. Uh, the Nebraska Rural Community Schools Association worked on considerations for developing uh, reopening plans for schools across the state, and we worked with them in that particular guidance. We also worked with the School Boards Association as they looked at what, what leaders, district leaders, needed to know about these particular plans. And as well, we've worked with local health directors on uh, as they develop core principles for opening schools. And so we have all of that combined effort uh, in place working together. We've also worked with school districts specifically on their plans, trying to make this come together in a meaningful way. One thing we learned was how do you really uh, best understand local risk and how do you communicate that to the public. And so working with, with DHHS, working with local health directors, um, and certainly the governor's phases as well as, as the um, kind of local risk dials that have been associated with local health, really put together guidance that, that has uh, kind of a green, yellow, orange, red, or phase four, three, two, one, as you would look at that uh, across the state. Uh, getting that alignment so it can be communicated as well as possible to our families and our teachers, but also building out specific things. If you're in the green, largely you're in a good position to be able to run schools in a full capacity perspective. We believe if you're essentially in the yellow, you're able to run, run schools in a 
uh, a capacity, but want you to be cautious, right? Make sure that you have all of the appropriate PPE and that there's an opportunity to maintain social distancing. As you approach an orange, for instance, you start to have to have, have concerns whether or not you can be at full capacity. And red is essentially that you're back to a position where you should be remote learning completely. So schools have been building their plans uh, along those lines, really looking at ways that they can ultimately uh, open up safely and do that well. But there's much more work to do. They've been very focused on the health side of this equation, um, but they've also been focused on the educational side as well, thinking about how they best build uh, educational plans for, for a lot of different scenarios. So it gives us a chance to be able to move forward. It gives us a chance to be able to move forward, uh, hopefully uh, collectively thinking about each situation and each condition uh, uh, that, that ultimately is going to improve educational outcomes as we continue to go. Um, we have actually also on our Launch Nebraska website, you can see these partner perspectives, but you can also see our planning guidance. Um, and some of that part, plan, scenario planning guidance actually lays it out for a, a partnership between the school and their stakeholders and, and discussions that are ultimately important for them to think through each of those levels and what's going to work, building by building. Uh, we encourage the engagement of students and parents and teachers in that planning process. It's been absolutely critical that everyone kind of understands their own risk and are able to understand what they need to do individually to make a particular difference in keeping that environment safe. Ultimately, in the end, we, we believe having students in, in schools is absolutely critical. We've heard that from parents. We've heard that from uh, communities all over the state. There's a lot of work yet to do, and I appreciate the governor kind of offering this opportunity over the next few weeks to be able to present how that progress is being made and how we're doing that statewide, and look forward to being able to share more of that as, as we continue. So with that, I'll end and uh, stick around for questions later. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And again, uh, we just, uh, you know, the schools have been a part of this since the beginning. You may recall that uh, as we came into this pandemic in March, it was Mark Shepard of Fremont, who was one of the first superintendents to make the decision that they were gonna go to spring break three days early so that they could, uh, you know, again, kind of a, based on a situation where they had uh, our, really kind of one of our first exposures was in Fremont. And so, uh, again, getting back to your kind of point about it's all going to be very tailored to each school district and those decisions. But, you know, Mark made that decision. And of course, uh, Dr. Joel and Dr. Logan in LPS and OPS, same thing, made great decisions with regard to how they were going to handle kids and going to spring break and how, you know, coming back, going to spring break and basically limiting that early on. And so it's that same sort of leadership that we'll need to be pulling everybody together, as the commissioner said, to be able to get kids back in school this fall. So thank you, Commissioner, for being here, and we'll look forward to hearing more as you develop your plans with your superintendents. Uh, next, I want to talk about one of the programs we have for our federally qualified uh, health care uh, organizations, our FQHCs. Um, these organizations do a great job of providing health care to people who have difficulty accessing it another way. Uh, we've got a number of facilities. I think there's seven FQHCs with 69 locations across the state of Nebraska. We've been very familiar working with uh, FQHCs like One World and Charles Drew in Omaha as examples where we've been doing testing uh, for um, communities of color. So, for example, in South Omaha with the Hispanic community, North Omaha with the African American community. So, again, just a great example of how we work with FQHCs. And we have an exciting new uh, uh, program here that we've got for, to help our FQHCs continue to respond to this coronavirus pandemic. And our CEO of HHS, Danette Smith, is here to be able to tell us a little bit more about that. Danette. Thank you, Governor, for having me this morning. And I am just ecstatic about the news that we're going to present this morning. As many of you know, the uh, Nebraska Federally Qualified Health Centers do a lot of work in Nebraska to make sure that our residents have the following services, primary medical, dental, and behavioral health services as well as those persons who are underserved in mostly some of our rural communities, as well as our communities of color. I know from previous experience, providing good health care in underserved communities is absolutely essential. And the persons that do that work and do that work well are our federally qualified partners. So this morning, the governor and I are happy to announce that we will be awarding 
through the Health Center Association, I mean Healthcare Association of Nebraska, that is the association that represents the FQHCs, $5 million. We hope that this uh, monies will be utilized, and we know it will be, to assist with the response to COVID-19. The uh, FQHCs will be looking at three areas. The first area, is case management for health care of patients. The second area is expanding testing and contact tracing. And the third area is stabilizing health care centers infrastructure. Let me just speak a little bit about the case management for health care centers for patients. Number one, they're going to be utilizing portions of that $5 million to really improve call center uh, staffing education, answering phones, questions, and, uh, and appointments. That's all very important to make sure that our residents in some of our communities are able to get tested. They're also going to be providing additional community health workers who will provide referrals, triage, triage services for patients, contacting patients who have been tested, and just making sure that we can provide them the necessary support that they need in their homes. The second thing that the FQHCs will be doing is they're going to be expanding testing and contact tracing. As you may know, on an average, they serve approximately 630 patients per week. With the additional staff and supplies, we know that they're going to be able to increase their contact tracing and their testing capabilities in their communities. And then finally, stabilizing health centers infrastructure. That is most important when you are serving populations of uh, being at risk. And so the areas that they're going to be focusing on is making sure that they can do testing year round. They're going to be looking at their uh, technology build and technology infrastructure support. And they're going to also be expanding their lab capacity. Again, Department of Health and Human Services, along with the governor, is excited to be able to award the Health Center Association, again, they represent the FQHCs here in Nebraska, $5 million to assist with COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, CEO Smith. And again, our FQHCs, our fairly qualified healthcare centers, do a wonderful job in serving people. So we're very pleased to be able to work with them on this $5 million grant to help them respond to the pandemic. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Danette, to you and your team for working on this and getting this pulled together. Uh, one of the other programs that we have to be able to help uh, recover from the pandemic was our business stabilization grants that we announced earlier this year. And we originally had those slated for businesses of five or more, and we got some feedback that uh, businesses that are one to four people would also like to have access to those grants. And so earlier this week on Monday, the Department of Economic Development opened up that grant uh, process to those uh, companies that have one to four people working at them. And so I just wanted to remind people that that has been going on this week and that today is the last day for people to uh, apply for those grants. So if you're one of those small businesses that has between one and four people that are working there, please go to the DED website and apply. Today is the deadline, so get your grant application in today. And then uh, next week, uh, our upcoming schedule is going to be Monday. Uh, we will be back here at 10 a.m. On Tuesday, July 21st uh, at 1 p.m., we'll be back in here and we will have our back to school uh, and we'll have President Carter of uh, the University of Nebraska talking about the plans for higher education at the University of Nebraska. And then Thursday, uh, we will have at 10 a.m. a Korean War and Veterans Proclamation signing uh, remembering our Korean War veterans. And now we're going to go ahead and get into the Q&A. And we had one question submitted ahead of time from Julie Anderson of the Omaha World Herald. Given the increase in cases in the past week in Nebraska and the fact that a growing number of states and cities are requiring masks in public places, will you change your mind and require masks in public? Again, we've always put together a plan here in Nebraska that's right for Nebraska. And we've asked Nebraskans to do the right thing. You know, for example, we asked people um, during our stay home, stay healthy, stay connected to you know, limit their mobility and only take trips outside the home that were absolutely necessary, and Nebraskans did. They, by and large, did the right thing. And so with masks, we're asking the same thing. We're not, I'm not going to make masks mandatory, uh, but again, we want to educate people with regard to when a great time to use a mask is, like when you're going to the store, if you're going to be inside, you're going to be closer than six feet to somebody, that's a great time to wear a mask. So please, uh, folks, 
use all of our rules, that six foot distancing, wearing a mask when you go to the store, washing your hands, those are all good opportunities to be able to practice the techniques that will help us slow the virus here in Nebraska. And with that, we'll go ahead and open it up to questions and answers from the audience. Yeah. So the question was, uh, you know, the spring, we started putting restrictions in place and uh, closed schools uh, on just a couple of cases. And uh, are there going to be conditions for closing down the schools as we go into this fall? So I would take a step back and just remind folks that in the past, even with the flu, the regular flu, schools took the opportunity sometimes when they had uh, a significant number of kids come down with the flu that they would close and, and give it a rest. So this is really going to be a decision that is going to be made at the local school level with regard to this. But broadly speaking, we're in a much different position now than we were in March. In March, there was a lot we didn't know about the virus. Now we know, for example, at least the, there's still a lot we don't know, but the early research shows that younger kids are not as impacted by the coronavirus, that they don't tend to transmit it as much, so we know a little bit more from that standpoint. Uh, we also have a much greater resource with, with, with the response. So for example, that two case rule you're referring to was really because we didn't have the testing to be able to know, and that was a kind of a rule of thumb we used to be able to understand when we might have community spread. We're in a very different situation now with regard to the resources we have with regard to testing, um, just you know, Test Nebraska, for example, uh, the number of people we're able to test there. So we have much greater ability to do that testing. We've got much more robust capability with regard to ro ro uh, contact tracing, so we can ask those folks who have been infected to stay isolated so they don't infect the rest of the community. We've got much more resources when it comes to quarantine space, to personal protective equipment. We've got plans in place to address our at-risk populations like long-term care or homeless shelters. Um, you know, we've put in guidelines with regard to how bars and restaurants operate, for example. So we've got a lot more infrastructure basically to manage this. And so when it comes down to uh, the decision of uh, individual school, uh, to close, uh, that will be really left up to the schools to make that decision and probably on a building by building basis. And I would just also, you know, remind folks that with all this additional capacity, what we can do is, is really look to be able to do the same sort of thing for schools that we would do for the regular population. So if schools are practicing social distancing, if they can keep the kids six feet apart in a classroom, for example, that's going to really limit the spread of the virus. And then if a child does test positive, you do the same sort of steps with regard to the contact tracing and getting that child to quarantine and isolate and so forth so that they're not infecting other people. So uh, I think it's just going to be managed a lot differently because we've got a lot more resources now and certainly in the fall than we did uh, in March when we didn't really know a lot about this. Other questions? Fred, you don't have a question? All right, yeah. So the question we as we go into this fall, what will be the goal with regard to uh, how we're managing this? And it's the same thing. It's about making sure that we can provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed, that ventilator, and protecting you know that healthcare integrity that we have here in the state. So the the north star that we use, that guidepost that we use, will remain the same. It's around preserving the healthcare system and making sure we can continue to provide that. And that's really what our benchmark will be as we continue to manage this virus. Again, folks, this is a virus. We can't stop it from coming. And we have to continue to manage it going forward. That's why continuing to you know, make sure you keep that six-foot distance when you're out in public, 
wearing a mask when you go to the store, washing your hands is still important for us to do even as we go into the fall. And we're all hopeful that there will be a vaccination that will be developed that will help us with this, but there's still no guarantee that will happen. So we have to think how we manage this for the long term, which means we have to take the proper steps to you know, reduce the risk, but we also have to start returning to a more normal life. And we, you know, we just covered, again, some of the points, of, uh, for example, about why it's so important that we get kids back in classrooms, because some kids just are not gonna learn as well with remote learning. That we've got nutritional needs, we've got mental health needs, we've got physical needs, all of which schools uh, address with these kids. So that's one of the reasons why we gotta continue to look for ways to manage the risk, but still return back to a normal life. More normal life, at least. So, uh, Commissioner Bloom, said you want to come up and address John's question with regard to is there a protocol that if a child tests positive, what is a, a school going to do? Yeah, in, in, in fact, that, that very issue of what happens is really uh, kind of also a matter of, of conversations with the school districts. But essentially, if you have a, a student there, they're going to come in and do, and the local health department and probably state as well are going to come in and do local contact tracing. The goal is actually to return to school as quickly as possible. So if there's a disruption, they're going to understand the, the likely uh, contact with, a, with someone that ha is positive, and then try to make sure that those folks are able to go ahead and isolate and then get back to school as quickly as possible, as quickly as they can. So that's the real key. Um, that's going to be really dependent on good communication between the school and local health officials and other health officials, making sure that we're able to do that well. And, and I think ultimately that's, that's our hope, to be able to get kids back as quickly as possible. Yeah, in fact, we, we're talking about protocols to actually make, make sure that the environment's safe. You know, we've had cleaning protocols in place and other things as well. But I think as we learn and know more about this, it's largely about that close contact and identifying folks that have been in close contact and, and, and letting them know and then coming back to, to that environment with, with folks that, that, that seem safe. So. Yeah, and a big part of this actually goes back to your previous question, right? If, if two students are wearing, if all the students are wearing masks in a classroom, that's less likely to be counted as a close contact than it would be if none of the students were. And so part of the dynamics of masks is it's actually a strategy to be able to return to school quicker and ensure that we can actually do that work quicker. Yeah, thanks. I just want to emphasize again what the commissioner said there, because I think that's a really important point. So as schools are looking at how they manage this, and if they are able to say have students be six foot apart in a classroom and they're all wearing masks, that is gonna be a much easier environment to be able to say, hey, you can, if one child tests positive, it's not a close contact, everybody can come back to class the next day. Versus if the kids aren't wearing masks and they're closer than say three feet, well, that's gonna be a very different environment where you say, oh, maybe everybody needs to be quarantined. Again, that will be a decision that the school districts or the schools have to work with local public health people, but you can see the more steps you take to mitigate the risk of the spread, the easier it's gonna to be to have those kids back in the classrooms. Well, again, I think that this is where the commissioner is going to be pulling together groups of uh, folks to be able to start talking about how we have the kids back in classrooms, whether it's the superintendents, whether it's the teachers union and so forth, to be able to work out some of those uh, you know, conditions for having people back. Again, if you're, and again, I don't want to speak for the commissioner here, maybe commissioner, I'll have you come up and talk about this a little bit. But if you're, again, somebody who's older with underlying health care conditions, just like in any other employer, you ought to be making accommodations for that person to be able to, say, do remote teaching. And uh, the commissioner, I think, has got some thoughts on that. So maybe, Commissioner, I'll have you come up and talk about that. 
Yeah, I, I, I think certainly as, as schools and teachers are, are now probably beginning more detailed conversations, and I think in, in Lincoln and otherwise, there's been a lot of work going on, um, and now it's really this phase of engaging teachers in those very conversations. What do you need? What otherwise do you need as we kind of build this plan out to a classroom level? And getting to that point is going to be really important. I think the thresholds for reopening and all those different things are those points of um, where we've really tried to work with local health officials and understand that and kind of balance the uh, uh, way the, the uh, pros and cons of the different environments, the, the opportunity to do that, and to really, again, I guess have some patience in working on those particular plans and building those together is going to be critical. Is that all right? It's really your sure, press conference, sure. Governor. <laughs> No, actually right now, and again, I think I hear this from school officials, uh, from local public health officials, everyone's really on this path of trying to get it to an environment where we can safely open for students. And so the path has been there. You know, what I would say generally to the communities at large, everything else that we do helps us get schools open. So we want to keep community spread low. We want to make sure that's happening. We want to make sure that uh, uh, the local officials know what that spread is, understand that risk, work well together, and, and, and somewhat be in a position that we can do that. If, if, if we have areas, just as the governor said, if we have areas that suddenly have uh, a, broad, a broad spread and a, a real concern of opening schools, those, those same conversations are going to be happening to make those decisions about opening and closing. So the question is, what if locals want to make rules for uh, requiring masks? So um, again, we'll, we want to make this a collaborative process. Uh, when you say locals, do you mean local businesses, or do you mean local public health departments, or what do you mean? Yeah, so uh, generally local health departments have to check in with us, and so they're not going to be able to make those mandates without us. We'd like to make this a collaborative process where we're working with our local public health departments on this. I encourage them to continue to educate people with regard to when you should use a mask. You know, if you're going to be closer than six feet in an enclosed space, that's when you should use a mask. But we're not going to mandate it. Other questions? Yeah. Well, Brandon. Um, earlier this week, uh, the Omaha Public School Board President came out and spoke pretty strongly about um, competing against sports recruiting this fall and said that he wished there was more leaders across the state that say, hey, Yeah, so with the question was with regard to um, uh, school board members saying that he wished that there would not be any sports this fall and so forth. And again, I think what I'd re remind people is, look, this is a virus. It's going to be with us for a long time. And we've got to find ways to be able to manage this. And we can. We can manage the risk. That means we're going to have to do things differently. Uh, we've done that all throughout the course of this summer, for example, with sports where We've asked people to socially distance. We've asked coaches to take that responsibility uh, with their sports teams to be able to do the socially distancing. And in fact, in, I think in my last press briefing, I used the example of a girls' basketball team where they were doing conditioning, and they were doing the conditioning 15 feet apart. And one of the young ladies came down with coronavirus, and the public health director made the decision that there didn't need to be quarantining among the others because they had been using that 15-foot space you know, apart. So again, we have to continue to find ways to be able to manage this. But I think the important thing is we've got to manage the risk, mitigate where we can, but also start returning to a more normal life. And I think sports are an important part of the school experience. And so we've got to figure out ways to be able to allow those sports. Now, sometimes that means it's going to, be, it's going to look a lot different than maybe it did in the past. But we've just got to be able to find those steps to mitigate that risk and manage it. Because this is something we're going to be dealing with. Uh, you know for the foreseeable future, so we gotta think about managing it for the long term. Yeah. Well, there's, there's obviously a, a push, a lot of momentum for the school 
was open, and um, it's certainly possible that with the new school year starting, that that we could we could actually have children who contracted disease and and die. Um, are you? How would how would that influence your decision making and perspective on pushing ahead with this COVID? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, again, I think that, so the question is about, uh, what about kids contracting this and a, and, a, and a child passing it? But as I mentioned before, a lot of the early data shows the kids are a lot less susceptible to this. Um, um, so again, this is about managing the risks to be able to mitigate that opportunity. And I'd go back to the, you know, the analogy I've used with highway, de uh, highway deaths. Uh, we know we could reduce and eliminate almost all highway deaths if we took the speed limit on the interstate down to five miles an hour. And essentially that's what we've done with the restrictions we've put in place. But we manage that risk by putting things like seat belts on and putting in speed limits, and that's what we have to do Think about managing this virus. So what speed are we going right now? Uh, Fred has asked me what speed are we going right now. I have not thought about what speed we're going right now, but we're, we're trying to find what is that right speed. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, number one, when it comes to, uh, you know, students' safety, that's always been a, a conversation between schools and parents. Um, it's really important that if parents believe their children have vulnerabilities, that they're working with their, with their school officials. So if there is something there, working closely with your school officials about the other options for a given student is important. Um, as the governor said, and I think the, um, the American Pediatric Association, I think that's the right term, um, certainly came out with theirs, but I've even taken uh, opportunities to speak to pediatricians in Nebraska and have conversations with them. We're wait also weighing the options of other damage that could be done. I actually talked to superintendents when we were first closing back in, in March about concerns about students that they had real concerns about social emotional health and maybe being suicide risks. You know, there's a lot of things that are in balance right now, and it's important that we have all those conversations kind of collect uh, and continue to have that relationship between parents and, and the schools as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, Commissioner, thank you very much. That's, that's, that's a great uh, point that uh, not only does this need to be a conversation about individual schools and uh, uh, individual students and keeping them safe, but there's a broader picture to look at too because there's other effects of not having kids in school. Uh, you mentioned the mental health care aspects. Uh, kids with special needs and their ability to get an education. You talk about uh, the nutritional aspects. So there's a lot of different things that you have to pull all together here to be able to have the complete picture of what is going to be best for our kids. All right, any other questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you all again very much for being here today on this press briefing. We are going to continue to keep you updated with regard to what it's going to be looking like as we speak with educational leaders about what this fall will look like with regard to our students. And so uh, we'll continue to keep you updated on that. But thank you again to all the Nebraskans who are taking those steps to slow the spread of the virus by making sure you're keeping that six-foot rule, you're wearing that mask when you go to the store, when you're washing hands. Those are all things that will help us slow the spread of the virus. And of course, ultimately what that does is make sure that we can continue to have a more normal life here in Nebraska. So thank you very much for everything you're doing. I hope everybody has a great weekend and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks.